Nobody got fired. Yeah. Nobody was censured. Yeah, Nobody I'm not worried about fired. getting fired. I'm worried about, you know, if an SEC employee can put a million dollars or ten million dollars in his pocket, and if the federal government doesn't like to pay him, he goes, to the SEC employee goes to an attorney and say, pay up. And I don't know if he can get sovereign immunity from, from you know, the, the government saying, hey, we're not going to pay up because this employee, you know, discovered this. But, you know, you want to get the Greek game going so that the SEC guys bang away at these people to make sure that they go down so they can get paid, the SEC people can get paid. Well, yes and no. I mean, if you start incentivizing by significant monetary recovery, SEC employees would become so intrusive they might bring the whole system down. And it's that's not true. out of the question, but, but that's not that's not really my point here. My point here is finding this thing out was not difficult. We didn't require Einstein sitting out there with, with supercomputers to discover this was a fraud. This was, at its basis, a simple thing to catch. And literally, a simple, when we go through this, a simple phone call would have found out. A simple calculation that says, and I'll give you an example. Madoff had $65 billion reported in his accounts on 113008. He was reporting trades based on a $65 million volume, $65 billion volume. He was trading on any given day more shares of a company like IBM than traded on the whole exchange by everybody in that day. Mm. All you had to do was look at Madoff's accounts and say, Madoff reported that he traded 5 million shares of IBM on December 10th, and you look at the Wall Street Journal, you look at IBM, and it traded 130,000 shares. Game's over. I mean, we're not talking about SEC employees doing much of anything here other than almost reading a newspaper. Yeah. <laughs> but if Madoff had, let's say, made 15, 20, 25, 30 percent of his transactions legitimate, and a guy went and looked at that one account number, how many one of the legitimate ones would have gone on, the scheme would have gone on. The only way you can possibly say that it would have been caught if Madoff did that, but to get an enormous number of counts to check them out, and how long would that have taken? How many manpower would that have taken? Okay. The account number for trading for the investment advisory part of the business on the second, 17th floor was DTC account number 646. That's not where the legitimate trading was done. The legitimate trading was done on the 19th floor mm -hmm. with a different set of account numbers. They were not investigating the legitimate part of the business. They were only investigating the IA. And all they had was a single account number to look at. Mm. Only one. Well, how did they get that one as opposed to one of the legitimate ones? How did he get that one or how did the SEC get that one? Well, when the SEC asked them for an account number, he gave it to them, right? Mm -hmm. Why did you give them that one as opposed to one of the legitimate ones? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Well, first off, the, the other ones would have been registered in a different name. If he had given him one of the account numbers from the 19th floor, mm -hmm. it would have been registered in Merrill Lynch or Vanguard or um, or some. If he traded, he did the actual trading for Vanguard, Fidelity, American Funds, and Janus for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So the DTC account numbers would have had their names on it, not Bernard Madoff Investments. So he had zero accounts in his own name that would have generally traded. On the 17th floor, there was zero. There was only one account number. And there was no trading in it for decades. No. That's stupid. <laughs> um, let's see here. <clears throat> Made us in prison for the rest of his life, as I said. There were two programmers, Jerome O'Hara, George Perez. They were arrested February 13th of 2009 on conspiracy, falsifying books, and yeah. other charges. And right now, they are cooperating with investigators. One accountant, his name was David Friedling, he was arrested March 18th. He was charged with aiding the investment advisor fraud committed by Bernard Madoff. It turned out, no one knew it, that the accountant for Bernard Madoff Investment Securities was a one-person firm located up in Connecticut. And this guy was being paid something in the range of $15,000 a month to audit the books of Bernard Madoff and obviously didn't do a very good job. A CFO of BLMIS, his name was Frank D. Pasquale, was arrested June 22, 2009. He was the uh, former finance chief for Bernard Madoff, had a lot of other jobs, and he was released on $10 million uh, fraud uh, bail. And uh, he's also cooperating with investigators, which is where we're getting some of this information. 
there's hundreds of financial lawsuits today, both against innocent investors who didn't know anything, like the example I gave you in Venus Securities, and uh, as well as individuals who we think did know something. And that would be, at this point, the owner of the Mets. That it's unclear if he really knew what was going on, but he is different than people like us who didn't have access to the information we had, and he was warned by internal accountants working with the Mets about this, and he's being sued not just for his net gains. He's being sued for every dime he took out. The lawsuit's a billion dollars. He had put in 522 million, he took out 570 million. The difference is what he would have been sued for had the trustee determined that he was really, didn't know. He's being sued for a billion, which is the 522 plus cumulative damages. Um, <clears throat> and we're gonna fill this out as we go. So we have, in World War II technology, we have the Allies. We have the unknowns and the neutrals, and we have the Axis powers. <laughs> okay, the Axis powers right now is made off. We're going to keep adding to this list as we go along. Here. Um, how would you bet an investment advisor? What would you do? Yeah. How do you select somebody to manage your money? How do you know? Okay, banks have these big wealth management divisions. Mm. So you assume if you're dealing with one of the big banks and you're dealing with their wealth management division, mm -hmm. you've got some degree of protection. <coughs> that wouldn't be a fraud, would it? How many trillion dollar banks are out there like BLMIS? Okay, when you do invest to an advisor, bigger better? Does that give you some degree of protection? I went through the yellow pages for the Doylestown area and I found 24 listings under investment advisors. Mm -hmm. okay? And they call to some of them and the average size of the firm is four. Mm -hmm. Can you trust any of them? How do you know? How do you know? You told me early on that you don't even believe your brokerage statements or your confirmation statements, right? And you have brokerage accounts, and you don't know if any of it's real. Maybe yes, somebody's just sitting there. But, but Michael, you have money to invest. What are you going to do? Where are you going to put it? Oh, well, I mean, the, the market seems like, you know, it's in America, it's an industrial country. It seems like the place to put the money, right? Yeah. And if you put it in real estate, that was a bad idea. <laughs> but you know, the point I guess I'm making is if you invest in a stock, you know you're taking market risk. Yes. The market yes. goes up, exactly. the market goes yeah. down. You don't think that you're relying on something where that statement itself was put in somebody's basement immediately when they spent the money. You would never think that's true. Right. That's why when I asked you up front and I said true or false, your brokerage statement represents what you really own. I expected everybody's hand in one. Mine would have. Mine would have. You have a bank account. Okay, you go to your bank and you deposit the money and they give you a slip that says you made this deposit. Really? But you told me that, that bank statement's real. How is that any more real than your brokerage statement? What is it? Yeah. Uh, Vanguard is a big player in our part of the world with two trillion, three trillion dollars worth of other people's money. They announced last year that they're they're put they're booting out Pershing, which supposedly was doing the printing <coughs> of these statements, and they're going to do it in house now. Does that make any sense? Do you know what I'm speaking about? That's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Does that make any yeah. sense to you to boot out Pershing, which is a third party, and do it all in house? Well, that's one of the problems with Madoff. Madoff executed the trades supposedly. He sent the trades from the 17th floor to the 19th floor, yes. which he owned. That's right. But and he they, printed his own statements. <laughs> but Vanguard doesn't own Pershing. Or it doesn't. The more that you do, and I think I've got it on the slide coming up, that if you really want to bet someone, you have to make sure the money is segregated in separate accounts. Yes. You have to make sure that whoever is evaluating those accounts, whoever the accountant knows, is a big firm. Although we know what happened with some of the big firms when you look at at firms that have just gone up, and it, it, it's, they didn't do a good job of it. Yeah. Price Waterhouse. Um, here's my suggestions. Independence audits. You know, you got to be careful who's doing the audit. Uh, we didn't know, none of us, the small people knew that David Friedland was a one-person firm. Um, so a major accounting firm gives you as much protection as you're going to get. You have to make sure that the funds are in segregated accounts, and one of the important things to make sure you have online access to it and take a look. Because Bernie Madoff didn't. Everything was done 
by through the mail. You had no online access to his accounts. What that allowed him to do, and you'll see it coming up in a later class, is mail takes about three days. He had a three-day leeway to play around with games and yeah. <laughs> and online access becomes critical. Spreading your money around from one place to another. Because if one person's a fraud, maybe the other guy isn't. Um, think twice if you're investing in something complicated that you can't understand. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to talk about that a little later, of how my mom and I got involved in this and what we were involved with initially before we got to Bernard Mayo. Matter of fact, I'll talk about it now. We have a couple minutes here. <laughs> we got invested through something called Abilino and in the 1990s. Abilino and Dennis was an accounting firm. <clears throat> And they were trading on, we had a small account of them, they were trading on hedge funds, supposedly by dealing with the differences between the value of uh, currency in one country versus another. Mm. Mm. And trading on that, those small differences. Yeah. And we got the statement stock from them, and I talked to my mom and I said, I don't know what these guys are doing. This is scary. We get a statement back that says, your $20,000 investment is earned 14% this year, and your account is now worth X. I don't know what we bought, I don't know what we sold, there's no statements, there's no nothing. So we were talking about closing it down in 1992. Mm -hmm. And in 1992, the SEC swoops in, and they investigate Adelino and Vienna, so they say that um, we thought that A and B was running a, a Ponzi scheme. And what we found out was that he was actually taking that money and giving it to Bernard Madoff Investment Securities, <laughs> and he was skimming off 4% for himself and giving his investors what was left. Yeah. And then the SEC goes on and they say, Bernard Madoff is one of the most respected money managers on Wall Street, former <laughs> chairman of the NASDAQ, and former this and former that. And I can't tell you how we moved from Abilino and Viennes to Bernard Madoff, but the SEC shut down Abilino and Viennes. And most of those accounts went to Bernard Mayo Investment Securities. Now I'm safe. We get these confirmation statements coming in about yeah. buying Fortune 500 stocks, and we get these monthly brokerage statements. And I see Civic up in the corner, and I see Lloyd's of London coverage for $10 million up in the other corner. And it's like, wow, we don't own this nondescript thing. What we own is IBM and Microsoft and General Motors. And and all this, and I felt that we're finally on the right track here. Adelino mm -hmm. Indianas was one of the first theater funds for Bernard Madoff Investment Securities, who was being sued by the SEC for something like $500 million. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of questions you'd ask about your advisor about their investing strategy? This is kind of interesting. What are your total assets under management? And what is the maximum asset you can handle without having your strategies be able to work? For instance, becoming the market. For instance, Bernard Madoff was $65 billion. In theory, if he executed a trade, he would have executed 80 or 90 percent of the volume of that stock in any day. He wasn't trading off movement in the market. He was the market, if it was for real. So if these guys get so big that they become the market, yes. they can't take advantage of fluctuations in the market because you are in the market. So don't let them get too big. What's the minimum account size? And if you know what the maximum they're handling is, and you also know what their minimum account size is, you get some rough idea of how many accounts they're handling, because they will tell you when I ask this question. So if they're handling too many accounts, be careful, you know, unless they're a Merrill Lynch that has 30,000 accounts. In the past 10 years, what's your annual return? Well, Bernard Madoff, for us, was 10.5% over 20 years. <clears throat> we earned somewhere between 0.3% and the best we ever did in any month was about 2%. Not the kind of numbers that you would shake in your boots and say are outrageous. Normal numbers. Can you show me monthly returns? What's your largest monthly gain and what's your largest monthly loss? Well, for Bernard Madoff, 0.3 to 2.3. Going up and down, generally settling in there about 0.8% a month. Nothing that would have scared you away from that. When you get accounts that go up and down and up and down, does that make you worry? Should that make you feel more comfortable? Well, you should feel more comfortable because that's what markets do, and volatility is part of it. But if you get an account that goes like this, and I've discovered since, is that's probably a lie because that's not what markets do. So you want to see some degree of volatility. How long have you employed this strategy?